Speaking of how deep it is, we got a new team to watch out for. The number one team in the SEC right now, 3-0 and in conference. 25 Texas A&M put an ass kicking on 9 Missouri. 41-10. to This game was over after the first quarter. After yeah. the first quarter. And it felt like one of those games, too, where Missouri at the start just couldn't get things rolling their way. Defensive P.I. in the fourth and one, fourth and two, which was 100% P.I. And then I have Luther Burden's 75-yard touchdown after Weigman drove down get removed because the legal man downfield. And I, I, I'll i say it for Texas A&M. I don't know if they can play another game like this, but I think this was the most perfect game I've seen from A&M in like three years, three or four years. All phases yeah. contributed and played well. This was one of those games that was like, ooh, remember a couple of years ago when they had that greatest recruiting class of all time? This game to me was one of those like, oh, you're a junior. Okay, you were in that class. Oh, you're a redshirt sophomore. Yeah. You were in that class. Oh, you were a junior. And like, and it's like, so those guys have finally figured it out and kind of find, finally figured out, like, got, gotten their footing in the SEC. Um, and that was a thorough ass kicking, what Texas A&M did to Missouri. Um, it was funny. We were texting, like, before the game, like, ooh, I bet you Theo Weiss is going to go off. Luther Burden's going to go off. Oh, Connor like, Wagman's playing? Oh, this is an oh, easy Connor one for Wagman, me Mizzou. They should have started Marcel Reed, stupid. <laughs> well, our apologies, Connor Wagman. Yeah, you, you shut sir, us up. <laughs> you shut us all the way up. Our text stream was thrashing you, and uh, you showed up and showed out. So, tip of the cap. Also, uh, can we talk about Mr. Moss, the running back? Ooh. Wow. He can run the ball, too. Oh, my wow. goodness. Yeah, like, and – Hold on a second now. If Notre Dame keeps winning, Texas A&M keeps rolling, it's a good look for both teams. Notre yep. Dame being able to go on the road to College Station early in the season, get the win. Obviously, Notre Dame getting that win. Now with Texas A&M continuing to roll, getting big wins in the SEC. Um, now is Texas A&M a viable SEC championship contender now? And, and is there now a quarterback controversy? Or did Connor Weigman kind of shut that down with his performance against Missouri? Yeah, yeah, a bunch of bunch of great questions there. I want to kind of break down what you just said. Um, yeah, let's start with Weigman first. So Weigman, um, heading into the season, there was a lot of hype around him, right? He said that they said he's got an NFL type of arm. He's talented. He's a junior. He's been in the program for a while. Um, first game against Notre Dame struggled hard. I mean, Notre Dame pressured him. They went man covers on the outside. Their wide receivers couldn't really win and just kind of confused Weigman. He takes him three weeks off, good to get hurt. Um, I mean, this was the first time. This was the first time, and I kind of compared to Quinn Ewers, where Quinn Ewers had that one game. You're like, "Yep, he's he figured it out. He's a pro now." We'll see if Wagman can do this again. But I feel confident when I say this. I think he had that type of game against Missouri. I, I think the, the throws he made, the confidence behind him, the back shoulder balls, and the placement he made too. I, I this is a game where I'm like. Okay, I see why people are have highly on him. I see why he got the start. And kudos to Mike Elko for doing that because how do you sit someone that's three and one? That's a dynamic quarterback in Marcel Reed, which to be honest, it's gonna be interesting to see where he ends up if he stays in the program or if he goes and transfers, because he's a talent. And I bet you they do use his legs at some point specifically, or if Weigman starts to struggle. But talk to me what you saw from Connor Weigman, because this to me was his coming out party. What I really liked was his accuracy down the field, throwing vertically. I think that was one of the things that um, Marcel Reed's game kind of needs a little bit of um, more development, him being obviously a redshirt freshman. Um, I think the fact that Connor Wagman was able, like I said, to push the ball down the field vertically um, with, with accuracy on time and on target was super impressive. Um, and then obviously one of the things too was just he avoided the big mistake. I think that's one of the things that I know you've probably heard me say this a lot on this podcast, but um, whenever a quarterback is kind of prone to the big mistake, you kind of have that like feeling like, okay, like he's prime example, Peyton Thorne's pick six that he threw against Oklahoma up until that point, Peyton Thorne was on his way to winning player of the game in that game. But he throws that crucial pick six that allows Oklahoma to win the football game. And now everyone's talking about, oh, Peyton Thorne doing Peyton Thorne things. And that's one of the things that you and I were texting about. It was one of the things that um, we kind of went into that game thinking. And to me, I think that was one of the things that Connor Wegman kind of had hanging over his head. Couldn't couldn't win the big one. Turnover prone. Always throws the backbreaking pick. And he kind of avoided all those things and was kind of able to put some of those things to bed this weekend. So hats off, sir. So you're able to run the football for 
236 yards, right? Okay, you're going to throw the ball for 276 yards with a quarterback that's 18 to 22. Okay, yeah, so that's pretty good offensively. And then you got a stout defense and a dominating front seven with front six seven. sacks, eight yes. tackles for loss. Oh my gosh! I mean, this this Missouri offense didn't stand any chance. They they went man on the outside against Luther Burton and Theo Weiss. They and said, "Hey, we will strap you." Where's that blanket at? <laughs> yeah, where's that Theo blanket? Weiss. Okay, apparently Mike Elko said that Eli Drinkwood set it up. So we'll see later on if anything comes out from that. But regardless. This defense, man, and the Nick Scorton is starting to get in his bag. One and a half sacks, two and a half tackles for losses. Like this game, I mean, the, the penalties offensive line they had for Mizzou was because of this defensive line at AM. But for AM to have six sacks, rush four guys all day, and maybe have a delayed fifth guy. I mean, you want to talk about an ass kick into what was supposed to be one of the best offenses in the SEC. You miss Cody Schrader. Luther Burden, I mean, was like, besides that one catch he had for 27 yards, was nowhere to be found. Talk to me what you saw from AM's defense and then Mizzou's offense. It was the front seven, man. Anytime you can get you can get Brady Cook off of his spot, which I don't think teams were doing a good job of at the beginning of the season, but getting Brady Cook off his spot and really – rushing the passer with reckless abandon. I think that's what the front seven of Texas A&M did a great job of. You said it yourself, six sacks, <clears throat> eight tackles for loss, I think you said. Yeah. Um, absolutely dominant performance up front um, by the Texas A&M front seven. And again, those are those guys that I was talking about at the beginning of the segment. These are the guys that were part of that crazy good recruiting class a couple of years ago that, you know, some guys transferred, some guys didn't. And those guys that didn't and that stuck around have kind of messed with the guys that stuck around as well. Um, and some of the newer guys that have come in and some of the veterans. And it's been a really good marriage between the two. And I think that uh, Texas A&M is really primed and ready for like a really good run at the SEC. If you look at their schedule kind of going forward, Mississippi at Mississippi State, home against LSU, at South Carolina, a bye week against New Mexico State, at Auburn, and then number one Texas at home. So – that is a very manageable schedule. And in fact, I'd say they're probably going to be favored in just about every single one of those football games until they play number one Texas at home. I think them too. I mean, if they're undefeated in the SEC, they're only one loss. And if they lose another one in Texas, two loss AM team, the way the season's been going on, Cody, and we'll get to it my buyer sell. I think there's going to be a lot of two loss teams in the playoff. And I think one of those could be AM and with their schedule and their these big wins, especially being Mizzou. Man, they're they're in the driver's seat right now. And I one thing too that you, you talked about the front seven and then be able to be able to play man on the outside. That was one thing that secondary stepped up for AM. Absolutely. Like I like think about teams right now that could that have the power to be able to just rush three or four and then drop seven or eight in coverage. Like, I mean, I think AM, I think Notre Dame can do it. Michigan is 50 50. I mean, their their secondary got we'll get to them next. I'd say Ohio Georgia. State, Georgia, Texas, maybe. Oregon this last weekend, which we'll get to in a little bit, but like Oregon, man, they're yeah, they can seven. they can do that against Ohio State too. Ho, 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 that game is gonna be sick. Um, can't wait for that. But let, let's let's go on to the next one. 